Hello, and welcome to We Speak CVE, a free podcast from the CVE program. On this podcast, we'll talk with people from the cybersecurity community about what else? Cybersecurity and vulnerability management and the CVE catalog of vulnerabilities. If you didn't know, the CVE program's mission is to identify, define, and catalog publicly disclosed cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Hello and welcome to the CVE program podcast. My name is Shannon Savins, and I am the chair of the outreach working group for the CVE program. And I have a special guest with me today. Madison, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Madison Oliver. I'm the manager of the advisory database curation team here at GitHub. So the reason that we wanted to have Madison on the program was a blog that she wrote that uh, several of us thought was absolutely wonderful. Uh, Madison, tell us the title of your blog and what was the impetus for writing the blog? Sure. So the blog post is called Removing the Stigma of CVE. Um, I myself, with some of my colleagues, wrote this blog post based on our experiences as a CVE naming authority and based on some user feedback regarding concerns with using CVEs as part of the advisories that maintainers on GitHub are publishing. So I thought this was a terrific blog, um, removing the stigma of CVE. It, it in some ways surprises me and doesn't surprise me that there's still the perception out there that CVE um, is, a, is, a, is a problem, is, is a bad for the reputation of an entity. I think we're um, coming to a place where uh, CVE is an asset, uh, becoming a CNA is an asset to a company and shows they're serious about addressing any security vulnerabilities and concerns. And so tell me a little bit about, you're at GitHub, Tell me a little bit about what made GitHub decide to become a CNA. Uh, tell me a little bit about GitHub as a CNA. Absolutely. So GitHub actually, interestingly, makes up two different CNAs. One of GitHub CNAs is our internal incident response team, and they're focused on assigning CVEs to GitHub products, um, GitHub Enterprise Server, Cloud, um, all of all of our GitHub products. And another team within GitHub is a separate CNA, which is my team. And our scope is to assign CVEs to vulnerabilities and open source software that are making use of our GitHub security advisory system. So maintainers who are hosting a project on GitHub can create a GitHub security advisory for free. While it is still in a draft stage, they are able to request a CVE from us. Um, my team reviews the CVE, curates on the data, gives them the CVE number that they can then include in their published advisory. You know, we do have a few other groups where uh, they, they have a, C, a CNA for their products, and then they have another um, vendor agnostic, uh, potentially research focused uh, CNA. And I think that is um, an asset to the community and gives people an additional uh, recourse for uh, getting an advisory, getting assistance, uh, and potentially um, correcting and, and broadcasting uh, patch availability, et cetera. But so if it doesn't make sense to be a CNA yourself, who do you go to for a CBE? On the C C A C V E's website, there is a list of all of the CNAs and the scopes that they cover. Um, both of GitHub's scopes are listed there very explicitly, as are other CNAs. So I think it makes the most sense to go to the CNA that is closest to the scope uh, that is covering the product that you're talking about and that you're publishing a vulnerability in. When, when there isn't a particular CNA that fits that scope perfectly, you're always able to go to uh, the CNA of last resort, which is currently MITRE. So they are able to filter all of other requests if there isn't a more specific CNA that covers that. Absolutely the perfect advice. Um, and every uh, CNA has a declared uh, scope uh, that they're assigning for. So um, 
when where to go and if it's not um and if it's not clear the c the cna of last resort i think can help direct people as well if needed yeah yeah absolutely and any any maintainers who are hosting their product projects on GitHub can use us, use me and my team um, as their CNA. If they are publishing GitHub security advisories, we are more than happy to support them. One question I, I come across sometimes is when is becoming a CNA worth it? Maybe um, you haven't had a lot of vulnerabilities uh, or a lot of vulnerability reports to date. Um, maybe you're starting to get more. When does it, in your opinion, when does it become worth it to explore becoming a CNA? Sure. And some some more context on the opinion that I'm going to give. I've been a part of both of the CNAs here at GitHub, and I've previously been a part of another CNA at the CERT Coordination Center. And from at least my experience, I think when you're in a position where you are regularly publishing about vulnerabilities, uh, with any sort of regular cadence, you expect to do this again. And especially if you find yourself in a place where you're the primary source of information. So you are the first, the original source of this new vulnerability information. I think it really makes sense to become a CNA at that point. It'll make the entire process for yourself faster. You're able to support your users or your customers more. Uh, and that seems to be when people typically become CNAs. And I tell people again and again that the requirements for becoming a, C, a CBE numbering authority, a CNA, are pretty easy to meet. I mean, you have to do uh, public advisories and you have to have a declared scope, um, but it's free, it's, it's pretty easy, it's an easy process. Um, and so if you do find that you're doing uh, regular advisories um, and you want help becoming, a, C, a CVE, a CNA, then, you know, uh, the CNA coordinators at MITRE can help do that, uh, can help you do that. Yeah, absolutely. One of, one of the things that I personally like most, I think, about the CVE program is the emphasis on freely available and publicly available. I think that speaks a lot to the, the mission of GitHub as well and our our desire to secure all of open source. CVE program aligns really, really well with that because to publish a, C a CVE, there has to be a public reference. Um, everything is publicly available. Everything is freely available. So I, I, especially as the manager of the advisory database, am very, very passionate about free and publicly available, easy to access, easy to digest vulnerability information. We should talk maybe a little bit about and especially for the research community, how are CBEs assigned and, and when are CBEs assigned and in, in what context? Do you want to talk a little bit about how that's done at GitHub? Yeah, absolutely. So at GitHub, we assign CBEs based on the GitHub security advisories that maintainers are creating. So a GitHub security advisory on a repository can only be created by a maintainer or somebody with administrative access to that particular repository. So that same person while creating the security advisory can also request a CVE number from us. So my team will review that uh, advisory. They'll review the CVE request, all of the information. We'll verify that it falls within the CVE rules. Uh, we will curate the CVE, we will improve uh, all of the data, add affected version ranges, um, the fixed version range, affected product information, a ton of really, really useful data to it. Uh, we'll provide that CVE number back to the maintainer so that they can include it in their publication. And then we'll also publish that data to the CVE program so it's publicly available for the world to consume. I, I think that's absolutely excellent. In general, I find that having done, you know, um, quite a lot of disclosures, uh, having administered disclosures for research organizations previously, I find that a lot of organizations assign their CVEs uh, at the end when they're ready to do an advisory. And uh, I remind people that the CVE is for the vulnerability, uh, not for the patch, 
but administratively for a lot of businesses, it just makes sense uh, to assign the CBE at the end when they're ready to do the advisory. And that's okay too. Yeah, I've seen the same thing and I've had some background now in incident response and vulnerability coordination. And depending on the length of the coordination and all of the work that is done prior to disclosure, a CVE could really be assigned at any point. So it's really left up to the CNA's discretion, which can change a lot depending on a lot of factors, um, including the coordination that's going on, who all is involved, uh, how long it's going to take um, before disclosure. So. It's really CNA dependent here at GitHub because all of the information that we are working with is open source um, and is all typically published uh, at the time that we are receiving these CVE requests. We tend to do it relatively quickly. So we're able to, and we try to, we try to reach this uh, timeline for our uh, customers. We are hoping and try to assign CVEs within three days typically. Yeah, I think that's really, I think that's really great. But I also think you raise a good point about, you know, there are some practical variables that um, particularly with, you know, um, with all different vendors, right? There are some practical variables that make response time in terms of CBE different for all kinds of practical reasons, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so because we have our CVE request built into our GitHub security advisory workflow, maintainers aren't able to request a CVE without uh, the security advisory itself. And part of the reason for that is because we want this information to be public. We want this to be shared and we want to encourage publication. CVE requires publication of at least one reference. So these, these two systems pair together very, very well. So we typically, at least in our process, because of the security advisory aspect of it, we are usually getting the CV request at, towards the end of uh, the disclosure. So either right before it's disclosed or after it's already been publicly disclosed, just because of the nature of open source and the, the place that we're filling in the community. Let me ask you a harder question. From a researcher perspective, sometimes you you see or hear the perception that CVEs are just a trophy. Um, and, and coming back to your blog and the topic of your blog where, you know, is, um, is, is having a CVE some kind of a, a liability, um, which I don't think so. But the other side of that coin is then are CVEs a trophy? How do you respond to that? We view CVEs as a, a lot more than a trophy. I, I want to focus less on the, the quantity of CVEs, the quantity that maybe a researcher has found or the quantity that have been assigned to a particular pro product or project, but focus more on the quality of the CVE. The quality of the vulnerability information to us is significantly more important. So my team is curating all of the security advisories that are within our advisory database. We're also curating on all of the CVE information related to those advisories. So we are huge, huge proponents of quality over quantity. We're trying to get away from the idea that CVEs are bad, they cause bad reputation for the software or for the vendor, um, that it's a stamp of severity inherently because it's not. A CVE is just a unique identifier for a vulnerability. Having that isn't necessarily a bad thing by any means. We want to encourage everybody in open source, all of our GitHub users, to get CVEs whenever applicable and share this information publicly. It's important for users to have this information. It's important for anybody using this package to have this kind of information. And I, I feel like um, two things you said really resonate for me. Um, one, I guess I sort of think um, let he who has no CVEs, you know, no vulnerabilities cast the first stone. I think, you know, everybody has had a vulnerability at some point. Um, you know, nobody, nobody is perfect. And, and so the best course of action is to say, okay, that happened. We fixed it. This is how we fixed it. And this is where that fix is available. And CVE you know, never intended to be 
a trophy, but it was intended to be a way to communicate and talk about that, that vulnerability. Um, and I love your point about severity. Uh, the CBE, you know, they have variable uh, severities, uh, CBSS associated with them. Um, and so, yeah, quantity or quality, not quantity. Totally agree. Um, what else did I want to ask you? I wanted to ask you about contesting a CBE. Sometimes, you know, coming back to your blog, sometimes you have a finder who, even if you're, you know, you're a vendor who you are quality focused, you're security focused, you're doing the right things, you're doing advisories, you're patching, uh, but a researcher brings you a report and you don't agree that it's a vulnerability or um, you for some reason uh, disagree with their, uh, with the researcher's findings. How, how do you contest a CBE um, and, and how do you contest a CBE with GitHub? Yeah, absolutely. The The way to contest a CVE um, per the CVE rules is to go to the CNA that it assigned it directly. So researchers need to determine who that is. And if it is GitHub in the cases that we are assigning, they're free to contest with us directly. Uh, we have our advisory database in a repository on GitHub. So filing an issue there is one way to reach us. The contact information that we have listed on the CVE website um, can also be used so researchers or maintainers that are disputing or disagreeing can email us at security-advisories at github.com and it'll reach the same team that is assigning the CVEs. It feels like a process that is fair. Hey, I want to give you a last chance to make a plug about your blog because I did think it was such great content and I wanted to just ask you um, any any final words on your blog and and um, one other of, thing? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, one other thing that I th sure. One other thing that I think we uh, covered in this blog post that I'm incredibly proud of and very proud of my team for all of their work in this too, uh, is that we gave a number of tips for writing a good advisory. I think that can be very useful for maintainers, for reporters, for really anybody that's involved in a vulnerability disclosure process. We say that more information is almost always better. Some of the information that you might want to include in your advisory are details of the attack vector, what can go wrong, um, expanding on the impact of this vulnerability, any of the vulnerable version numbers, any of the patched version numbers, if there are any, uh, any publicly available links, especially links to the fixed commit, to any relevant pull requests that have information or communications from the reporter or the maintainer on them. And then your own assessment of the severity is incredibly helpful. So when we receive advisories or CVE requests, my team will create their own assessment of the severity, but it is really helpful to have that from maintainers or from the reporter, somebody who's very intimately familiar with the vulnerability details. And that gives us a really good starting place. It's great advice. It's not too narrowly templated and it's all the right questions. Totally agree. All right. Well, Madison, I want to thank you very, very much for coming by. Uh, this is a great blog. If you haven't read it again, uh, it's removing the stigma of a CBE uh, on the GitHub blog by Madison Oliver. Um, Madison, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on the We Speak CVE podcast, which is available for free on Buzzsprout and the CVE website. If you'd like to participate or suggest a topic, please contact us on the CVE website.